Good morning and good morning. So this is unfortunately the last of the 2024 Science on Saturday lectures. I know, I know. I was reading online on the internet, so I know it must be true, that when you go to a concert, your heartbeat starts to synchronize with the rest of the audience, right? So the question is, at Science on Saturday, do your brain waves? <laughs> Since you're not exercising your mind, you're exercising your body. I also just heard that uh, sad news that I thought I would share with everyone that a uh, few of you will know, know who this is, but there used to be someone named Ruth Levy who would sit somewhere right over here. I had to be in her late eighties and she moved to Florida. Her daughter moved to Florida. She called herself Ruth, the truth. And Ruth would say to me and others that, uh, she came to science on Saturday to exercise her mind. And then she went to Tai Chi right afterwards to exercise her body. And I don't know how old she was, but I heard a few months ago, Ruth passed away, it, probably in her mid nineties. And I think for me, part of what I love about science on Saturday is the fact that someone in her eighties or nineties is here. And we have third graders and fourth graders and sixth graders here all to exercise our mind together. So I want to say, before I give thank yous to some other people, I just want to say thank you to the audience here. Thank you to the audience online. It's been 40 years of science on Saturday at this point, and generation after generation just keeps on coming. Now, it, this doesn't happen by, by chance. It takes a variety of different people working incredibly hard. So uh, first of all, Harry, you got to raise your hand. Now I am going to embarrass you. To Harry and to Anthony in our IT department who make sure that the Zoom and everything runs, would you give them a big round of applause? And I know, I mean, as I make the joke every time that you're here for only one reason. But the bagels and the coffee are really the tip of the iceberg. Everything involved to get our speakers here, to get the advertisements here, to get everything to happen for this program to run so smoothly happens because of Britt and Dee Dee who are in the back right there. If you give them a big round of applause. They're both part of science education. Science education has spent 30 plus years working on programs like this and others. And the head of science education is in the back right now. And that's Dr. Arturo Dominguez. And someone has to pay for the bagels and the coffee. And if we didn't have the support of our laboratory director, this program would not happen. Would you please give a round of applause to Professor Steve Calley. Uh, I have to tell you, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of you know about the various parts of my life. I get so much out of being here with you every single Saturday. I cannot thank you enough. So with that, let's use plasmas to create quantum technologies and diamonds with Dr. Alistair Stacy. I'm beyond thrilled that he's agreed to be our last speaker. He's a managing principal research physicist here at PPPL, an expert in diamond technologies, including diamond synthesis by plasma vapor deposition. So I guess Superman's not squeezing coal. He's using plasma vapor deposition. Extensive experience in diamond materials with quantum applications, over 100 publications area, and you can tell he's only 21 years old. His research interests specific focus on surface science of diamond, novel diamond growth, surface termination chemistries. You're going to learn all about this now. He only joined PPL last year to develop new quantum materials and support the new applied materials and sustainable sciences initiatives. You please welcome Dr. Stacy.
So I briefed them. Uh, so over last time of 2024, I'll go through the three questions. First one would be if you would share with the audience, when did you first get interested in science? So my father's a mathematician and physicist. So for me, it was probably one or something like this. Zero. <laughs> uh, so you couldn't help yourself, I suppose, couldn't is the answer. Yeah. It, so, it, it, as with most people, it was either really understand believe, feel, and go that direction or run for the hills. And for the <laughs> you're here. So, okay. So from you're here at one year old, but you've gone through a PhD. Share with us a, a teacher at any point who was influential on you. So, so I must apologize to all of my teachers because I've had many fantastic teachers, but actually my answer is the same. My father, um, I think I was about six or seven and he, he took me, and he, he took me to a wall and he said, stand near the wall Take a step just just halfway between where I am and the wall. Take another step halfway between where I am and the wall. He said, keep doing that. You're never going to get to the wall. And this annoyed me <laughs> for months. I sat there thinking, how the heck can I keep moving and never get to the thing which is that far from me? And and for me, that was that was kind of it. Again, it was a run for the hills or just embrace yeah. it. And for me, well, it was a run for the wall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, last question. Something, you know, your bio just talks about all of your work with quantum and other things, but something that interests you, a hobby that's not related to science. So, so I love flying. I ran out of money a long time ago, but I love flying. Um, and I have three kids, so I love doing anything that they, they love doing. Wonderful. So with that, using plasma to create quantum technologies and diamonds by Dr. Alistair Stacey. Thank you. And thank you everyone for being here, especially on the last the last one. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm really happy to be here, really enjoying it. Um, I'm not sure if the slides will do the do justice, but we'll see how we go. Uh, I should point out that I'm, oh, it's not actually sharing. That's clever, apologies. Try that again. There we go. So uh, I, sh I should point out that I'm actually on a joint appointment with the lab here, and I'm a professor at RMIT University, which is in Melbourne, Australia, so roughly there uh, through the planet. It's a fairly long flight, but I've managed to deal with the jet lag so far. Uh, so today, I'll, as, as described, I'll be trying to talk to you about plasmas, diamonds, and quantum properties. Um, I'm not sure if everyone will understand what a picture of a half alive, half not alive cat means, but it's really that combination of these three things that is what I do every day and it's what we're doing now here at the lab and what I'll be trying to do today is to just kind of describe to you in in a uh, understandable sense the essence of why we're doing all these three the, these three things why we're bringing them together and what's interesting about them uh, and why do I have a picture of the sun well I guess we'll see that in a little bit Okay, so I'm just going to try, before I get into the details, to really try and motivate why we're doing this. And we're doing this because we want to make sensors, things that see things, detect things, and measure things. This is really important in all of our modern lives. Our phones, when we go to the doctors, when we use our car, all of these things use sensors, and they use more and more sensors, and they use better and better sensors. And especially in the medical space, the better the sensors get, the better our health gets. The, the, the more we can see what's happening to people who need it, and the more we can understand what's happening so that we can develop things like drugs. And what we're finding is that most of these things that we're now needing to measure are either really small and subtle or weak, um, or, or, or they're things that are so tiny that we don't currently have sensors that can see them at all. So for example, if we take a human brain and we take one neural cell, the cell that does all the work in the brain, we can put that on a dish. We can do that without killing people. We can put that on a, on a, on a plate of something and we wanna try and understand how that works. How does it respond to drugs? How does it talk to the other neurons? How does the brain work? But it's actually not that easy to see whether that neuron is actually doing something. We can physically see it with a microscope um, with our eyes, but we can't see whether it's doing anything because what it does is very subtle. It's very low energy. It's trying not to waste too much energy. So for example, it does generate a magnetic field as the, as the current flows through the cell, but that's a very weak magnetic field. It's a very localized magnetic field. It's a very small field. And so we need to develop something that can detect that 
Um, and this is the talk will really be about why we're developing diamond as the material, for example, to measure these neural cells, and also why that diamond quantum sensor might be able to be used to actually see what's happening inside a, a human's brain while they're using it without having to chop things up. Uh, a second example of quantum sensors is drug design. So there are molecules, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with, with the pictures of a molecule, there's a bunch of atoms stuck together in a specific shape, specific atoms. Each molecule does a certain thing and a very small change in the molecule can, can make a profound difference to what it does in, in the body. So we've got to be really careful about how we design things. And sometimes we find molecules, we know what they do, but we actually don't know what the molecule is. And we have really big pieces of equipment to try and try and understand what they are. But one of the things we can't do is we can't see single molecules. We actually don't have the capability to take one molecule and look at the structure of that molecule. We don't have any equipment that can do that. And so one of the things we're trying to do is develop a technology that would let us do that. So we might have a slab of diamond, that's what this is meant to represent, with some sort of quantum system inside the diamond, and we can talk to that quantum system, and that's what the rest of the talk's about. And if we can do that the right way, we can do it well enough, then that quantum system will tell us where each of these atoms are, and will tell us what the structure is. You could ignore all of that, that's just the technical gumph, but it will tell us what it looks like. And then we can use that information to try and design things. Another motivation for developing new, new sensors, the quantum sensors, not just um, what we call classical sensors, is to sense things at really extreme scales. So you might have satellites zooming around the Earth. At the moment, we've got people trying to put quantum sensors in satellites to detect the magnetic field from the Earth, to talk to each other, so to sense whether there are other things flying by. There are even people, there's a problem with debris around the Earth from previous satellites things flying around that might hit satellites. So there are quantum sensors trying to detect these little bits of metal flying around. Um, if we can detect them, maybe we can do something about them. And at the other end of the scale, again, we have a human cell. And if we zoom inside the cell, you've probably heard about the nucleus and all the different parts of the cell. I'm not a biologist, so that's pretty much all I understand of it. Um, but, but I know that we need to understand what's going on in a cell better and better if we're, going to, if we're going to develop our understanding of medicine and, and really improve things. And one of the things we need to understand is what's happening and how does that heat the cell? So different parts of the cell might be at different temperatures to other parts of the cell, but the cell's smaller than most temperature probes. So we can't just jam a temperature probe in the cell and see what temperature is here versus here. So we need something that we can put inside the cell that can act as a sensor, which is really, really tiny. And it turns out that a diamond, a little tiny little particle of diamond that's much smaller than the cell, can actually do that job for us. But it's so small that we need to use the quantum properties for it to work. So we need to do things on really big scales and really small scales. Uh, the third motivation, especially since we're in a fusion lab, is trying, trying to sense things in extreme situations. So the example here is a tokamak. Um, apologies, this is the, not the tokamak just uh, across the car park there, but this is the, <laughs> this is the bigger one in, in Europe. Uh, these are really, really aggressive things. I'm sure you've heard about fusion plasmas before coming to PPL, PPPL for so long. Please tell me we've had talks about fusion plasmas before. <laughs> very good. Um, so these are extreme environments. We have very high fields, extremely hot. Um, we, there are other situations where we have high pressures, say sensing things deep in the ground. Uh, we might have radiation. So this thing's going to generate a lot of radiation. There are things in space that generate a lot of radiation. The Earth is amazingly good at protecting you from radiation. So when we try and put sensors in any of these situations, the sensor now needs to be robust, but still be sensitive. And that's something that turns out to be easier to do if you use quantum, the quantum properties of your sensor. Uh, so, so these are the motivations. We're just trying to make better sensors. It turns out that quantum is the way to do that. Um, to, to describe what a sensor is in a little bit of detail so that you can kind of understand what I mean by a quantum sensor, a sensor is really a, a, a physical system that responds to the thing that you're trying to measure, and it gives you something that you can measure. So if we're trying to measure the weight of our baby, especially as it's growing, we're trying to see if it's eating properly, then we can hold it, but we're not very good at telling weight necessarily, although I'm sure some mothers are good at it, I'm not. Um, so we need to design a system which takes weight, the, the, the force from the baby as it sits on something and turns that into something that we can read. 
So we might, for example, put it on a cantilever with a spring. The heavier it is, the more it pushes the spring down. And then that end of the, the cantilever or the seesaw, if you like, is it called seesaw in America? Yes, perfect. Thank you. By the way, ask questions, especially if I say something really confusing. Um, so the end of the seesaw is going to go up and down, and we can measure that position. In principle, we can do that perfectly. In principle, it doesn't matter how light the baby is or how little a change in weight the baby has, that will just produce a tiny little change in height, and we can measure that in principle perfectly. And so we have an infinitely good sensor. It's infinitely capable of telling us perfectly what the weight is. In reality, there are all sorts of things that happen that make it not perfect. So the spring might not change length exactly as the weight changes. The, the board might wobble a bit. There might be a bit of wind. We're not very good at seeing exactly where on the, on the, on the um, measuring tape the board's got to. There are all sorts of things that make it hard for it to be a perfectly good sensor. And so in the end, the sensitivity, how good it is at actually telling you exactly how much the baby weighs depends on a bunch of things. But fundamentally, what we're limited by is the fact that we're, we're wasting an awful lot of space and complexity. There are all sorts of things going in here that we don't care about. We just care about the weight of the baby. And the bigger the sensor and the more stuff going on, then the more confusion there is and the harder it is to get that really precise measurement that we need. And it turns out that if we're trying to make a really good sensor that doesn't have all of those problems, it's better to make a really small one that doesn't have all the complexity. The problem is, if you look at things that are small, you get an additional complexity that you didn't realize you were going to get, which is that quantum physics starts taking over. So if I, so, so I'm going to try and, for a few slides, going to try and explain to you what I mean by quantum physics and, and explain how that might affect this sensor that we're trying to build. And then eventually I'll explain why we're using diamond for that. So essentially, if I look uh, at a piece of space between my hands, right? There's, there's gas here. We, we all know that there's gas. Uh, most of the gas is nitrogen. Some of it's oxygen. That's pretty useful. It's nice that it's there for us. There's a bit of CO2 that's not very useful and we're getting more and more of that and it's becoming less useful. There's only about one part in a thousand of that. And then hydrogen is really small. Um, we love using it at the lab. It's very useful. We love having it in the sun because it generates light. Um, there's not much of it, I guess, because it's light and it zooms off up into space. Um, but it's very small and it's very simple. So that's the one I'm going to focus on just to explain uh, how being small affects the properties of something and how the quantum physics comes into this. So if we zoom in on that hydrogen atom, uh, I'm not a particle physicist, so I'm going to say that, that we can just break it down into two elements, a proton and an electron, just, just one of these hydrogen atoms. So a proton is the thing in the middle of the atom and the electron's the thing that zooms around. I'm sure you've all heard this before, but as soon as we get to this scale, what the electron does near that proton is not what we expect it to do if we just think of it as a ball and a ball. So if I zoom out for a second and, and sort of say it's a bit like a satellite, in this case, the space station going around the earth, the electron basically does go around the proton in the same way. But the way that it can do that and the physics of that is very different. So, and again, I'm sure you've heard this before, but it's kind of, it helps to, to put it in perspective of what we're trying to do. So the way I would explain it in this context is that the space station can change speed. It's got some engines, I guess, or someone at least can put something next to it and change the speed. And if it changes speed, its orbit will change. So it's zooming around the earth. If it speeds up, if you do it in the right way, you can just make sure you end up in a higher, uh, or, uh, higher orbit, so longer distance from the Earth. So we can just change how far it is from the Earth. It'll keep going around in circles. And we can do that kind of what we call arbitrarily. So we can say, well, it's at, oh, I wish, I don't know, what is it, 20 kilometers or something? <laughs> Whatever, the, can't be 20 kilometers. Okay, who knows how far the space station is from the Earth? There you go, yes. kilometers all right we'll take that answer do you want to do the rest of the slide or are we good okay so so let's say it's about 200 kilometers thank you uh, and we want it to be at 212 kilometers that's fine we just change the speed we, we we use our engines we change the speed and we can put it at 212 
we see something zooming nearby and we're worried it's going to hit us, we can change back to 211 and we can go up to 213. It can go, it can sit at any point it likes. Um, we know this with balls, we can throw them as fast as we like as long as our arms are strong enough. With the electron, even though it's fundamentally just a thing going around the thing, the electron can't do that. The quantum physics says, and we can describe this, but we, we can't really understand it because there's nothing that we touch and feel that does this, but the electron can't choose to be a little bit further or a little bit less far from the proton. It has to be at what we call a quantized, and that just means a discrete or a uh, accountable uh, distance from the proton. So it can be here or it can be here, and there's another one. So there are a number of levels that it can go to, but it can't arbitrarily choose to go between them. It has to be here or here. So this quantization is actually what makes the entire world work. It's how chemistry works. It's, it's why we can sit here. Um, but it's actually not something that we're used to. And it, and it creates a rule, a, a quantum rule. That means the objects don't do what you expect them to do if you're just using normal engineering or physics. And, and that has implications if you're trying to design things. The second rule that's a bit weird is that it's not just like a satellite moving around in a nice circle. Unfortunately, because of the quantum physics again, it, we don't really know where it is. It's in what's called a, a cloud. There's some uncertainty in where it is. So we just say, well, it's, it's zooming around. We know it's at that distance roughly, but we don't really know where it is. And we don't really know which direction it's going at any point in time, which is really confusing, but it is what happens. The third thing that this weird quantum object does that, that's a bit hard for us to understand because we, we can't see it, anything that looks like this in real life is that it can be in two orbits or, or two positions at the same time. So it's a bit like asking the space station to be at 200 kilometers and also 215 kilometers. You, you can't be in two places at the same time unless you're an electron and you're, and you're obeying quantum physics. So the fact that it can do two things at the same time not is not only confusing, but it adds a lot of complexity. So if you're trying to design a system that responds to something, knowing that it can somehow do two things at the same time and respond to two things in two different ways at the same time means that you've got to you've got to understand that to be able to make your sense of work. Okay, so that's quantum physics. Uh, you don't need to understand it. Most people say they can't understand it because humans don't really understand things that they can't get used to. Understanding usually in this context means I believe it. And I believe a ball bounces this high because I've bounced a ball this high. If I've never seen a ball before, then maybe I don't believe it bounces at all. So, so people feel like they don't understand quantum physics just because they don't see it. But in as far as we ever understand anything, we understand quantum physics because we can describe it. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second. The final thing that kind of does matter for us in terms of designing things, you don't necessarily need to understand, but it's a, it's a real confusing point that we really don't understand properly is measurement. So if you want to measure something that's a quantum object, that's got one of these weird quantum properties, for example, I want to measure whether it's in th at this height from the proton or at this distance from the proton, I can actually measure that. That's something I can do. And weirdly enough, if I do measure it, oh, is this going to work? No, <laughs> sorry, I should have had another slide. If I do measure it, it kind of collapses. So let's say I measure it and it turns out that it's here, and then suddenly it won't be in those two places at once, it'll just be there. So if you measure something, it changes what it's doing, uh, which again is not, if you look at a bouncing ball and you say, well, I know it's there, it doesn't change what it's doing, but with, with the quantum objects, it does. And that's something that we have to, again, deal with. Ah, and, and my uh, analogy here is if I had a, a seesaw again and it was a quantum seesaw, so it's nice and small and it does quantum things, I could put it in a superposition, we call it, is a nice word for just saying it's doing two things at the same time, a superposition of being like this and like this. I don't know how to show that on a screen because super, doing two things at once is not something I can have on a picture, but, but this is the best I can do is kind of draw it like this. Now, if I was to walk up to that, seesaw and it was in a superposition of these two states, I could kind of measure where it was by just putting my hand there 
And if it's there, it's going to hit my hand. Hopefully, hopefully it doesn't hurt. But as soon as it hits my hand, I know where it is. And that's a measurement. So suddenly it's not going to be doing two things at once. It's going to be here. If I can't feel it, this is a really confusing thing. If I can't feel it, I've also measured it. It just means that it's not there. It's here. But it's still no longer doing two things at once. OK, so quantum physics is kind of confusing if you think about it too hard. Um, but it is what actually happens. So the really interesting thing for us as technologists is not that weird things happen, it's that we can actually engineer them. We can make them do something that we want them to do. So if I put two of these weird quantum seesaws together and I make sure they interact at a certain point, and I hope no theorists are watching this because I don't know if I've done something a little bit imprecise, but if I, if I put two of these together then and I make sure that they can hit each other, and, I, and before I made them hit each other, they were both doing both things at the same time, now they're interfering with each other. So if this one happens to be up and this one's down, they'll hit each other and they'll know. Now they're kind of measuring each other. So you might expect that that means that suddenly, suddenly they're both up or, or, or if this one's this way, this one's this way and they, they stop being weird. But actually in quantum physics, if those two systems are just left to, to be themselves in a nice controlled way, they can both still do both of those things at the same time. But it's still true that they can't be in the same space. And so we have what's called a conditional probability. So we have a, a state where not only is this system doing two things at the same time, and that one's also doing two things at the same time, but by forcing them to sort of see each other, we now add an additional thing, which is to say that even though they're both doing two things at the same time, they can't both be like this and this because then they'd hit each other. So now we have a big complex system where they're doing two things at the same time, except that if this one's in this state, then this one has to be in that state. But otherwise, they're still doing everything at the same time. So, so the system just gets more complicated. And if we're trying to describe that mathematically, then the math gets a little more complicated. But it's still coherent. I, sorry, that's not a useful word. It, it's, it's still doing the quantum thing, um, and it's still obeying the, the quantum physics. It's not suddenly become not quantum just because there are things interacting. Okay, so as a quantum physicist, one thing I'd really like to do then is have lots of them. Um, and, and now it gets really complicated because if this one's like that, that means this one can't be like that, it has to be like that, but then that means this can't really do that, it has to do that. But remember, they're all still doing two things at the same time each. So the system can get really complicated and that's really useful. Uh, either if we're trying to make an extremely sensitive sensor, the more complex it is, the more information you can get. Or on the note of information, if you can design this system and you can kind of set the state of it and you know exactly how it works, you can use it as a computer. And the amount of information that is held in this massive set of things that are interacting with each other and doing multiple things at the same time is enormous. So ideally, if we can make computers out of these things, then and we can make them at the same density that our, our normal computer kind of has in terms of electronics, then we can get an enormous increase in our ability to process information, to calculate things, predict things, design drugs, and all these kinds of things. It's very complicated, and we haven't got there yet, um, but we're making good progress. Okay, so that's, that's the quantum side of things. Um, we primarily will be talking about sensing. Um, I just want to say very quickly, in, in case it kind of helps you to understand, we understand this insofar as we can write equations, so we can predict everything, and everything works the way it's predicted. So as far as we know, the equations that we use to describe how the system works are correct. As far as we know, we understand quantum as a species, even if, even if no single person actually feels like they understand it. So we're very good at predicting what will happen. Um, what's confusing is that we're not very good at kind of imagining what will happen. And, and we're not very good at uh, predicting in our own head what's going to happen. That usually it's the, the mathematics or the, the computer simulation that will tell us what's going to happen because it's just really confusing. Uh, and, and this has kind of led to what's, what has been described as the kind of shut up and calculate description of quantum physics. So people say, well, what does this mean? What do you mean you can be doing two things at the same time? 
some people say, well, actually what's happening is there are parallel universes where the, the seesaw is doing this in one universe and the seesaw is doing that in another universe. People literally argue about exactly how it is that we can describe what's happening in a physical way that we, that we understand. And because we can describe it and we can't quite agree on exactly how we should describe it uh, to, to people, some people say, well, we should just shut up. We, we, know, we know what the, the calculations are. We know what the math is. So let's just, let's just agree that we don't feel like we can understand it, but we can still make things. And that's essentially where we are. But I will stress there are still, still some things about quantum physics that we don't understand. Um, and so there are still people that are interested in using this, these kinds of systems that we're making to test new ideas in quantum physics, to see if we can actually understand what this measurement thing means. How does that work? Um, see if there are things that we don't understand about quantum physics. Currently, the, the, the uh, math that we have does predict what will happen, but that doesn't mean it's correct. It just means that it's, it's currently consistent with what we have. All right, so what can we do with, science, with quantum? The first thing we can do is actually just predict how things work at all. Um, and we've actually done a very good job of that, and that's really what's made things like computers work. By saying that as we, this is a silicon chip in a MacBook, I think, uh, which is a piece of silicon with lots and lots of little structures with electrons flowing around as currents. Uh, technically, this is not a quantum circuit, right? It's the same thing in your phone. It's the same thing in your computer. It's not designed to be a quantum system. But as we make these things smaller and smaller and smaller, we get to the point where there are something like 10 billion of these things on a little piece of silicon. Each of them is only kind of nanometers big. Now, I'm a physicist, so nanometers instantly mean something to me. But to you, uh, a three nanometer uh, transistor, so the smallest element of this computer chip, only has a, a, a something like a dozen silicon atoms. So you're actually counting the number of atoms involved in this in this little part of your system. And because they're individual atoms, they really do obey those quantum rules and they really do interact with each other in these complicated ways. We're not controlling it. We're not trying to measure any of the quantum states, but they obey, they obey those rules. And if we don't understand those rules, we won't design this properly. So by understanding the rules at least a little bit really helps us to design these things and make them work. It also led us to designing this thing. So, so lasers, work by, by using some of these quantum properties of gases, these electrons at certain orbits. And it's the quantization of that that really means that we just have one color instead of there being lots of different colors. So people have already used quantum physics uh, and chemistry to do things uh, that aren't quantum machines, but to, to make things that work. Uh, as I said, we're also trying to, to see if we can make things to understand more about quantum physics. So this, this idea that we've used quantum physics to make normal things is called the first quantum revolution by saying, well, we understand quantum, let's, let's see if we can make normal things better. The second quantum revolution is when we actually start using these quantum states deliberately. So designing systems to take advantage of them. Uh, and there are a couple of different ways of describing it, but in my mind, the second quantum rev revolution starts with things like quantum sensors. When we start making systems using that, that weird quantum uh, property of the system and then using that to measure something. But that can be a pretty small, simple system. It only needs to be one seesaw, if you like, or, or in our case, one pair of electrons. We don't have to make a big complex system. We don't have to have all that weird measurement stuff going on, but we're still, we're still designing something to be quantum and then using the quantum properties deliberately. So that's the second quantum revolution. And then the third one is what a lot of people are trying to do at the moment, which is make this big array of quantum systems, make them talk to each other in such a complex way that we get information and, and we make a quantum computer. So that's like the quantum sensor, but it's just bigger and more complex and therefore harder to do. Okay, so mainly what we're doing at the lab is this one. Um, we do work with people at Princeton University and others to see if we can contribute to the quantum computing efforts. Um, and there are even some people that try and use diamond to make quantum computers. Uh, but it's not primarily what we're trying to do here at the lab. Um, maybe next year. Um, okay, so, so if you want to just get a holistic understanding of why, uh, why we're engineering things the way we are, what we're trying to do is use quantum systems. 
but we're trying to stop them getting confused and, and losing all the information. So what I didn't say was if you, it, every single atom in your body is a quantum system, right? Because they're all atoms, they're all tiny, they have electrons, they're, they're all doing the quantum things. They're doing it all the time. They don't stop being quantum objects just because they're inside your liver. Um, but what happens is that there are so many of them interacting with each other so much that all the information kind of gets messed up and lost and averaged out. So I'm no longer able to look at your arm and say, well, I can see it. I can see a quantum vibration there because it, it's too complicated and it kind of just averages out. So if we want to engineer quantum systems and not just describe things, what I'd like to have is a big area of nothingness, which doesn't interact with the quantum system. And then to just put one or two that I want in the middle of that, isolate them, make sure they're not talking to anything else. And then, and then we have a nice simple system that I can control and understand and do something with. So that's what I'm trying to do, but I've got to find a way of taking a couple of electrons or a couple of atoms and then using them. And it's hard to use them because they're tiny. It's hard to isolate them because they're tiny. Um, and most things that they interact with are also quantum. So, so it's, it's hard to choose the right system to do that with. So the simplest way to do that and how a lot of people in quantum physics do this is they take actual atoms uh, or in this case molecules. So, so they don't usually use hydrogen for, for, the, for the case of the, the slide. We'll talk about hydrogen. So we know these are nice quantum objects. We know that they're, they obey all these cool rules. We want to keep them apart. We, don't, we want to stop them touching things. So let's put them in a box. We'll pull all the air out of the box. It's just vacuum now. There's nothing in there. And, and now they're not bouncing into things and they're not transferring that quantum information and getting all confused. But unfortunately, they're going to move. Oops, they are a gas. And so they're still going to bounce around. They're going to hit each other and they're going to hit the walls. And every time they do that, every time they hit each other or a wall um, or get really close to each other, they start transferring that information and things get more and more complicated. So it's actually a little hard to just use a few atoms in a box. So what some people do is they use lasers in the box uh, and then they trap these. You, it turns out you can use lasers to trap atoms. And you can trap individual molecules or individual atoms. If you have a bunch of lasers, you can trap a bunch of them. And now they stay there and they're not moving and they're not interacting. And now you do have a, quantum, a, a set of quantum systems that you can, you can work with. So that's great and that's fun. But it's, in my mind, it's kind of problematic because there are these big vacuum boxes. There's all this equipment required to do this. So what we're interested in doing is asking, can we make this a bit easier? Can we, can we put it in a material that doesn't require us to use all these gas um, things? And um, can we make it more complex and more usable? Uh, so, but we still want to keep these key elements, which is to keep them isolated from each other and to have just the right number of them in the right controlled way. So one way of doing that is to try and have a, a solid material. Um, tell me if I'm going too slow. Um, to try and have a solid material where instead of, instead of having molecules bouncing into each other, they're kind of tied to each other because they're in a solid, which is great because um, no longer can we have one moving around and doing crazy things. It just stays there. But unfortunately, it's a solid, so they're constantly bumping into each other. So in some sense, uh, we have less random interactions, but it's a lot faster and actually get the same outcome. So most materials are really bad. Most materials don't isolate anything from anything, and we can't control of the quantum states. And so most materials are not useful. We can kind of help by, uh, so, so when they're hot, even though this stays in that position, it's going to bounce around a lot. If we just cool the material down, we can kind of stop them moving. And that helps a lot. They're not really bouncing into each other very much. But we need big fridges to do this, and they need to get really cold. So some materials work really well, like silicon works beautifully if you cool it down to millikelvins. So a thousandth of a degree above zero, then it works really well, but that's extremely cold. Um, and, and it's a bit hard to do anything with that. Uh, so that's not so great. The second problem with a lot of materials other than they move around and cause problems is a lot of them have um, atoms in the material that also cause problems, um, oh. such as having nuclear isotopes that are actually magnetic and the magnetic things interact with each other and cause problems as well. So you've got to have the right material Almost no materials are the right material, except diamond. And that's why we're talking about diamond. So sorry, I've taken a bit too long to get here. But, <laughs> but the, the, the reason we use diamond for quantum is just because it happens to be an amazing material. 
Diamond is just made of carbon atoms and it just looks like a solid material like any other solid material. But it just happens that these carbon atoms are so light, they're so small, and they're so close together and it's so rigid that they don't move much anyway at room temperature. It's just a property of the diamond. And, um, and what that means, and, and the electrons are sort of bound. So each of these carbon atoms, the electron is stuck there. It doesn't, unlike a metal where the electrons just move around, which would be a problem because that electron would take all the quantum information and take it somewhere else. The electrons are all stuck there. The atoms are all stuck there. Kind of nothing's happening. Okay, so that's really great in terms of not losing quantum information. We, we call it a solid vacuum. It's like having a vacuum because nothing's happening. Except that unlike a real vacuum, if I take a quantum system, and I'm just going to make a red circle for now, and I put it in the diamond lattice, it just stays there. It doesn't move. And this is beautiful. I can actually work with one, one little pair of electrons. I'll describe that in a second. Inside a piece of diamond. I, don't, I think I have a piece of diamond in my bag if anyone wants to see one at the end. And I can have that one pair of electrons in one place that I can put it in my hand, and it just stays there, and it's still a nice controlled quantum system. So that's why we use diamond. So just it's it's basically this example where we're in a nice plane of nothingness with the controlled systems that we want. I'm going to very quickly just take a, a tiny diversion for a second because I'm a diamond person and, and the director hasn't told me I'm not allowed to talk about diamonds. So I'll talk about diamond for a second. Diamond's awesome because it's really stiff, just like I described. The carbon atoms are all stuck together. It's really hard. It's the hardest material that we can make uh, or find. And so it's used to do all sorts of things that need hard materials, like dr uh, drilling. This is a massive thing that drills a tunnel, like for a train or something. At the ends of each of these little things here, you might have a big piece of diamond or a little piece of diamond, lots of pieces of diamond that are very good at cutting into rock because it's harder than everything. Um, and so that, that property, which is good for quantum physics, is also really good for lots of physical things like drilling, cutting, grinding, polishing, it's used in all sorts of situations where you need to physically do something. Um, for example, polishing something here, you might take a piece of diamond. This is what the pieces of diamond actually look like. You might glue it to a rod and then, and then this is a lathe. So you spin it around and the piece of diamond gets rid of all the metal and the diamond doesn't really change because it's so darn hard. So diamond's got some really extreme properties that other people use. It took us a while to realize that they'd be good for quantum physics. Um, I've also done a lot of things with diamond that aren't quantum physics at all. It turns out it's really good for uh, windows, for really high power lasers, high power RF. There are, diamond windows are used for some fusion applications um, because the diamond's so strong, it can handle a lot of power. So you can put a lot of power through it. It's a window, so it's transparent. Um, it also happens to be stiff and strong. And so it's really good in acoustics. You can put it in a... Uh, a little speaker up there, a little tweeter, it's called a tiny little speaker at the top of a really expensive set of sound systems. Um, and it, because it's so stiff and, and strong, it can make sound without distorting. So you get a really nice high quality sound. So you can buy a little piece of diamond to put in a speaker, um, which I actually helped to, to do that for a car. There's a BMW you can buy speakers in which are made of diamond. Um, you can do bionics. The so diamond's really good for putting, this is an eyeball, sorry about the picture. Um, it's made of carbon. So it doesn't interact badly with the body. Uh, unlike silicon, the body doesn't eat it. So if you try and put a silicon chip in the body, it'll just dissolve. The body's actually a pretty aggressive chemical environment. The diamond is actually really good for bionics because it's biocompatible. It doesn't cause problems, but we can do all sorts of things with it, um, such as putting it at the back of an eye for someone who's blind. And we can dope the diamond in a certain way, change the diamond so that it can actually excite the, those cells at the back of the eye and give give some sight back to the person. So that's something that um, we spent some time doing. There are other versions of biomaterials where you put diamond in with metals and that helps to give the body something to interface with that it likes. Uh, so I won't talk about anything else, but there are lots of amazing properties that diamond has that makes it useful for a lot of technologies. But the one we're interested in is quantum. So the problem is I've, I think I've tried to tried to convince you that diamond's an amazing material and it's amazing for quantum things. But unfortunately, the problem with diamond, I, I, does anyone have a diamond ring? I don't know if you want to tell me. Yep, yeah, yeah, perfect, thank you. So don't freak out, but it really doesn't want to be there. It doesn't want to exist. It doesn't, it doesn't want to be diamond. If you ask it what it wants to be, 
It wants to be a little lump of coal. It wants to be graphite. Um, so, so don't tell it that. Maybe we'll be fine. So we call that metastable. It's stable. It's, I'm, I'm sure it hasn't changed last time we looked at it. And, and it'll be fine tomorrow morning as well. So we call it metastable. It doesn't want to change right now, but it really doesn't. If you ask it what it really wants to be, it really wants to be graphite. And the way I describe that is a bit like a house of cards. You can put a house of cards on top of each other if you're good at it, and it just sits there. It doesn't move. But what it really wants to be is a pile of cards on the table. Now, as a technologist, this is a problem because if you shake the table, the house of cards does take the excuse to turn back into a pile of cards. If you heat a diamond, it will take that excuse and turn into a lump of coal. Um, and sorry, the, the picture I had before was it, basically that these are carbon atoms. The actual structure is in this three-dimensional, everything stuck to everything sense. In graphite, there's these sort of sheets, which look like sheets of card. And if you heat it, they basically do the same thing. They'll flatten and sit on top of each other. So if you heat up a diamond too much, it will turn into a lump of coal. And yes, I have done it. Um, so, so just be careful. I'll tell you what temperature later. Um, OK, so we've got to figure out how to make diamond if we're going to use it. So we figured out a while ago that one way of doing it is to make it the way the Earth makes it and use high pressure. So the, the diamond at, is, is a much higher. Uh, density is not very useful, is it? These things are st stacked together a lot closer than they are in graphite. So if you turn into graphite, it takes up more space. So if you do the opposite and you just give it less space by squishing it together, then it has no choice but to kind of turn into diamond because you've just jammed all of the atoms together and it turns it into diamond. So you can use high pressure to make diamond. Um, and people have been doing that for quite a while and it works pretty well. It's not very easy um, because the type of pressure we're talking about, the analogy people use is the Eiffel Tower, which is 10,000 tonnes. Oh, you need that in pounds, don't you? No? Oh, you don't need it in pounds. Can you convert to pounds? You're pretty good with them. It's a lot. It's really, really heavy. It's okay. So if you turn this thing upside down and you put it on a Coke can or a soda can, which is about this big, 10,000 tons on that amount of space, that's the amount of pressure that's required to grow diamond. It's insane. So it's not something you do accidentally. Um, and it's a big machine. I should have had a photo. It's a massive machine. It's kind of half the size of a house. It's really impressive. Um, it's so much pressure that the actual machines that people actually use often break. The machine breaks itself before it grows the diamond. So it's a lot of pressure. Um, but it can work and you can do it. Um, or you can wait for a meteor. So there are some diamonds that people find which were meteor slammed into a graphite deposit and it created a bunch of little diamonds. Um, so you, or you can actually you can do it with explosives. Is the other way of doing it. So if you can make a lot of pressure, you can make diamond. It's really hard as a technologist, though, to do any of these things in a really nice, controlled fashion that's really clean to make a real technology, um, at least of the ones that I to work with. So we've got to find another way. But before I get to that, just because it's fun, um, that diamond that you have, if it's a natural one, is probably between one and three billion years old. So they, that pressure does exist deep under the earth, so it does grow diamond. The reason we don't have, and there's a ridiculous amount of diamond in the earth, don't tell anyone with a shovel, but it's pretty deep. The problem is that there are lots of volcanoes that, that bring material up from where it's made, which is great, but most of the volcanoes have hot lava, and unless it's fast enough, um, the diamonds unfortunately take the opportunity to turn into graphite on the way up. So we would have a lot more diamond if it wasn't for that. There are only very specific volcanoes that are capable of doing it fast enough to not ruin the diamond on the way up. And that, I think that's one of the reasons why the diamonds are so darn old. OK, this is what the high pressure, high temperature diamonds look like. They're kind of yellow. Um, we're more interested in the ones that are clear and less impurities, but I'll talk about that in a sec. OK, the other way of doing it, and what we actually do in this lab, is to convince the diamond to be diamond by finding a way of tricking it into not falling over. We do this by kind of saying, well, I'm going to assert that this is true. If you make a house of cards, mainly the reason it falls over is because something on the outside, one of the outside cards starts falling, and then everything else kind of goes with it. So if you have some sort of scaffolding to hold all the outside cards, it might be pretty stable. We might, it might make it easier to add cards if we've got something holding them. So we do that chemically 
by in, in our diamond lattice by adding something to the outside to kind of hold it there and stop it wanting to be graphite because it's the outside that goes first um, and, and it goes first at a lower temperature. Um, so we do that with hydrogen, which is really good. Uh, but we then, we now have to have a source of carbon to grow diamond and a source of hydrogen. And then one more complication, which is that if I have this stack of diamond that I'm trying to stick the hydrogen to, I can't use normal hydrogen, molecular hydrogen with two of them because it just bounces off. It doesn't really react with the diamond. If I want to get that hydrogen stuck to the outside to convince it to grow, unfortunately, I need atomic hydrogen, these individual atoms, and that's where the plasma comes in. Uh, and then, and then, yes, I know you would have asked, so I'm going to answer the question. You do need carbon to grow diamond. You can't just have hydrogen. So we also add a bit of carbon to, to the mixture. But the real key is actually the hydrogen. Okay, so how do we make hydrogen? Basically, we just, uh, sorry, how do we make atomic hydrogen from molecular hydrogen? We just heat it up and it breaks apart, basically. And that's what this lab's been doing for 70 years. Is that how old we are? Yep. Uh, for 70 years, what we've been doing here essentially is trying to figure out how to break apart hydrogen. If you heat it up enough, maybe a few thousand degrees, it breaks up. If you heat it up even more, maybe 10,000 degrees, it splits apart. The electrons just fly away. Then too, too high energy to stay near the near the middle of the proton. And then if you get really, really hot, something like 100 million degrees, then they're so hot that these things that have already split apart can actually stick together again by slamming into each other and fusing releasing piles of energy, and you've all heard that story before. Um, luckily, uh, even though I've come to the place that's really good at doing all of this, I only need the really low temperature one. So what I need is the kind of training wheels, kitty version of, of what Steve does, um, which is great because it's a lot cheaper. Um, so I don't need the big machine. Have they all seen the big machine? Yeah? See the big machine if you can see it. It's awesome. So I don't need the big one that's, that runs at ridiculous powers to make ridiculously high temperatures. I just need a little one. And I think I'm not allowed to tell you how to do this at home, so I won't. Um, but you can get to the right temperature in a microwave oven. In fact, the, the machines that we use use almost the same technology, actually, just a little bit more fancy. Uh, and to the point of carbon, yes, any carbon source will do. Um, so people have actually grown with tequila and all sorts of things. Um, I guess it won't taste as good once it's a diamond. But... Uh, the reactor that we use is a slightly more fancy version of the microwave oven, but it's still basically a microwave oven. Um, and that's me when I was closer to 21, I guess. Um, so that's the sort of thing we use. We grow diamonds. The plasma is usually about this big. Um, and that's great because it means we can grow plates that are about this big. So we don't have to grow tiny ones. We can actually grow big pieces of the diamond if we want. Um, and for technology purposes, that actually is useful. We don't usually grow it massive, but there are people that have grown like 60 carats and things like this. And, and this is the technology that people use to grow synthetic gems that people can buy now as well. Um, what we're interested in and why I've come here is to work with the plasma people who are really good at designing these things and understanding them and modeling them um, so that I can make the diamonds better, more pure, bigger, We've done something crazy um, and and basically just make the technology work better. Uh -oh. into my ear. There we go. Okay. Uh, maybe I shouldn't explain this too much because I've probably gone a bit over time. Um, but essentially, what I think I've ho hopefully convinced you is that Diamond's really interesting for quantum technologies. It's really good at keeping these quantum properties alive. Um, we can make these little quantum defects in the diamond. So we can take a diamond that's completely inert quantum wise and we can add one little quantum defect. And it's called a defect because all we're doing is ruining a tiny bit of the lattice. So the lattice, a piece of diamond that I usually hold has got something like a thousand billion billion carbon atoms and I can replace just one of them if I want, just one with a nitrogen atom and another little defect. And then I'll get a little structure in there which is not diamond, it's something else. And that something else there are two specific electrons. I don't know if you can see them, but there are two electrons here that really matter. And those two important electrons, which can be the same two electrons for months. I get to talk to electrons. It's really fun. Um, it's okay, right, to talk to electrons? Um, but they do talk back, but they're confusing because they're quantum. So those two electrons, 
They also talk to each other and they make what's effectively a little bar magnet, but the two electrons are actually magnetic and they make a tiny little bar magnet, which is a fully quantum bar magnet um, inside the diamond. And that's really what we use for the technology. In case you're interested, there are lots of issues. You have to make sure you don't have other traps in the diamond because the other traps might steal the electrons or they might give them too many electrons and that also ruins the quantum properties. Um, so we also need to worry about defects, things that aren't carbon atoms, which produce magnetic fields. So our little bar magnet that we like doesn't want to interact with people that it doesn't like um, because they interact with it and then you lose all the quantum information. So we've got to make the material as pure as we can. And luckily diamonds actually pretty good at this. Um, if you make diamond impure in different ways, you get different colors and people love this if they're buying gems. This is the Hope Diamond, it's got boron in it. And the boron gives you the color. Uh, this is a diamond with lots and lots of the quantum defects that we really like, it just happens to make it pink. Uh, and this is the high pressure, high temperature one, which is yellow, it's got lots of nitrogen in it. So we just need to control that. We need to control how much of the diamond is defective or something else uh, in the right way to get to get the system that we like. And one thing we might like to do is have more than one of these quantum defects in, in a nice array. So they're talking to each other in a complex, but only just complex kind of way. And that's where we really start to build the quantum technologies that I was talking about earlier. Okay, but how do we control them? So you've got a big block of diamond, you've got the nice little quantum system, one pair of electrons is really, really tiny. How the heck do you talk to that? Well, it's a bit like sitting on the moon and trying to talk to a person on the earth. The only real way we've got of talking to people on the earth, we can't semaphore with flags because it's a bit too far, um, is usually lasers and radio waves. We might talk to them by radio, or we might talk to them with a laser, kind of pulse the laser or something like this. So that's exactly what we do as how we talk to the defect inside the diamond. And ironically, I was really happy when I figured this out, um, the scaling is almost exactly the same. So the size of a person with respect to the earth is almost exactly the same as the scale of our little defect that we like with regard to a big um, couple of carat thing of diamond. So it's tiny. Imagine trying to talk to one person somewhere in, not even on, within the entire Earth. So the lasers are really helpful. Uh, and luckily, when you hit a diamond with the quantum stuff in it with a green light, it actually glows. That's the glowing that makes it really help. So it's basically sending a signal back to us, which is pretty important. Um, that's great. And it turns out that if you take that little quantum defect inside the diamond and you hit it with a laser and a radio wave, and then you change the frequency of the radio wave at a certain point, uh, just because of the exact energy properties of the system, at a certain frequency of the radio wave, the magnet, the little tiny quantum magnet will start spinning and it changes its fluorescence properties, how bright it is. I think I did a thing here. No. Oh, anyway, I've got another one in a second. It changes its brightness right as you hit the resonance. And that means you know that you're controlling the quantum system. The really cool thing is that we can do that in a really controlled way. So the first thing we can do is we can say, well, great. If we can measure just by looking at how bright it is by shining a radio and a laser on it, it'll tell us what magnetic field it has because it turns out that the frequency at which it rotates changes with magnetic field. So the, the, the shininess of my tiny little diamond, and maybe it's a few nanometers and is inside a living cell, we've actually done that. The shininess of it tells us the magnetic field, which is really cool. So it's a sensor. That's, so, so I finally got to the point an hour and a half later, the sensor bit is it telling us something that's useful just by shining at us. Um, so that's a simple way of doing it, but there are much more complex ways of doing it. It turns out with that radio wave, you can get it to spin around, but if you change sort of how long, how much radio you put on it, it changes how much it spins. And then it turns out if you do it just the right way, because of the quantum physics and not in a way that's very easy to describe, it'll actually end up in a superposition of two states, this way and that way. And now it's in a superposition, which is cool. So I can actually ask it to be in the superposition I want it to be in so that it can then tell me something uh, about the state it's in. And we've done an experiment like this where we have a, a diamond on a bench and we do this experiment with radio and, and laser and an elevator nearby goes up and down. And as it does that, the diamond changes how bright it is. So you can actually see where an elevator is in another room, another building, just by looking at the quantum properties of this thing. So it's the magnetic field that it's seeing. 
It's extremely sensitive. And it gets brighter again as the elevator moves. Okay, so that's actually an example of actually making a diamond and using it to sense something. Um, if I go back to the start, now you can understand a little bit more about the context of that first light. So we have a diamond that's full of these little quantum defects, and by shining a laser, and there's the, the radio things here, it's just not on the picture, um, it will tell us if one of these neurons is firing, if it's generating a tiny little magnetic field, that little bit of diamond is glowing differently underneath there if, it's, if the neuron is doing something or if it isn't. So we can actually see whether the neuron's doing something or not. Or we can make a tiny little diamond and just use some light and some radio waves, and it'll tell us what the temperature is in different parts of the cell because the frequency at which it does things and, um, and how, it, how it spins is sensitive to temperature as well. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you. I should say very quickly, there are tons of people that are involved in all the elements of this. So this is just a random sampling of people. Um, and the reason we had the sun at the start, can anyone answer the question why I put sun on a slide? Yes, hydrogen plasma. The sun's just a big hydrogen plasma. And if you put some carbon in there, it'll make diamond for you, I guess. Thank you. As hands go up, uh, microphones are coming down. So... Yep. There, oh, there we go. Uh, first question is right there in the back. Uh, See it? Okay. So, so does when you're holding um, sorry, the molecules in place with a laser, does the wavelength of the laser matter? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the laser has to interact with the molecules. Um, it's a really good question. It's not actually my field, but it's okay. The, there are different ways of using a laser to hold the molecule. Sometimes it's the electric field that's in the laser that's kind of holding it, if it's a charged molecule. Um, sometimes it's actually the it's actually the photons, each photon from the laser actually has momentum, and it'll actually push the thing. Now, I, I have a friend who does this, and he talks about it. It's a bit like trying to stop a tank with ping pong balls. You've got to use a lot of ping pong balls to stop a tank, but they do have some momentum. So, um, so yeah, the, it, it depends on how you do it, but yes, absolutely. Uh, there's a person in red right here. That, that was a nice presentation. Thank you so much for uh, choosing this topic. So I have a couple, two or three questions, if you allow me to ask. So the first is, like you said, that we have to heat the diamond uh, to convert into graphite and then put a pressure on it. So I don't understand maybe what's the difference. Like you had to heat it and then put a pressure. Maybe I don't, yeah. Can you explain? Yeah, yeah sure. So Why do we have to like not... Um, yeah. If you take an exist, if you take a piece of diamond, mm -hmm. carbon atoms are already in the diamond form, mm -hmm. and they don't quite have enough energy to turn back into graphite, which is what they want to be. If you heat it an enough, about sixteen hundred degrees, it's a bit hotter than the oven, but but in bushfires this happens. Um, then you give it enough energy, and they just break apart and turn into graphite. Mm -hmm. If you give it enough pressure, it prefers to be diamond. If you if you have temperature while it's under the pressure, it doesn't really matter. Um, in fact, people use temperature to make it grow faster and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, so so basically, too much too much energy. If there's no pressure, it turns into graphite. If there's enough pressure, then it prefers to be diamond, no matter what. Mm -hmm. does, does that answer the question? Okay, I'll I'll try and find out. And the other one is like you said, we you are creating some wall of hydrogen around that. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Does that convert that uh, uh, carbon molecules into something different, like methane, ethane, the wall that you're creating? Because you're attaching hydrogens to it. So it yeah. does not necessarily remain the same carbon atoms that was in the diamond, right? That's a fantastic question. I've spent most of my career trying to deal with that question, basically. So the, the, the diamond's a crystal lattice. At the very surface, it's not actually diamond because each carbon's only attached to two carbons. And then the two carbons are in, you know, hanging off the edge and not, so it's not really diamond. The top layer is not diamond and that causes all the trouble. Um, so yes, if you put hydrogen on it, then you're kind of making those surface carbons half methane and half diamond, which is fine. But if you do it too much, then you will etch it and the carbon disappears and turns into methane. So absolutely. 
and and uh, sorry about that i'm holding everyone but <laughs> the last question is when you say that whatever the neurons are emitting then you would be understand what the neurons are actually doing so is there any medical benefit to what you're studying yeah there i mean there are lots uh, half of the time it's really about fundamentally under seeing what's happening um to just for that exact example if you take someone's i think it's stem cells mm -hmm. you can grow someone's neurons on a plate and you can actually see how they work and then you can you can um, use drugs to see how it changes how they work uh, and that actually allows you to see what the drug's doing without needing to put in a, in a real person's brain thank you so much thank you everyone for there's another question just two people over um so um carbon has uh, carbon 12 doesn't have a magnetic moment but carbon 13 does do you ever make diamonds with pure carbon 13? Beautiful question. Absolutely. Yeah. We've got a bottle of unnecessarily expensive carbon 12 methane that we use to grow the diamond. So it's been purified to just be carbon 12 um, for that exact reason. Yes. Because the, the nuclear spins are not very strong. Um, so we can make a quantum system and, and it's okay that we have. So, sorry, normal diamond, normal carbon has about 1% carbon 13. Um, and that one percent is is magnetic, but it's pretty weak. So we can we can deal with it, but it's a much better system if we get rid of it. And we we do do that when it matters. It also makes the diamond twice as thermally conductive, which is something I didn't say. Diamonds ridiculously thermally conductive, so much more than anything else, and that's used in a lot of applications. And that doubles it. <clears throat> if you the isotopes, because they're different masses, they're different weight. And the in diamond, unlike most materials, the thermal conductivity is phonal. It's the vibration. So if you change the weight of it, it kind of it gets in the way of that nice uniform vibration movement of the heat. Um, so if you make it all carbon twelve or all carbon thirteen, it, it is a lot more thermally conductive. To yeah, you're yeah. right, uh, right there. Uh, yeah. So thank you for the presentation. I was just wondering if you could. Hello? Oh, yep. There you go. Sorry. A beautiful presentation. Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the nature of, you were saying um, when you're modulating the diamond with the radio frequency and you hit a superposition of the, the magnet, is that related to the Zeeman effect at all? Or is that, if, I was uh, just curious about that. A yeah, bit. great question. So the, the thing where I, and I, I think I did it a bit fast, but the, the Zeeman effect is where the frequency changes with magnetic field because the energy is changing with magnetic field. Um, putting it into a superposition, what you're actually doing is you just got to figure out where that resonance is at what frequency it wants to rotate. And then you set your, your radio frequency at that frequency. And then it's the duration of the pulse. It's the amount of energy. So if you're familiar with Rabi flipping, you put in Rabi flipping and then you okay. set it at halfway. Yep. Thank you. To your left in the front row, uh, right over here. Thank you. Uh, I, I have two questions, both about the, orbital you mentioned in the beginning and the first one is when you draw the picture of satellite i think the phrasing you use is so interesting you said if we change position we can get a different speed or vice versa i don't know exactly now i think this is so confusing as well as so confounding how can you trade space for space and time Okay, and my second question is a follow-up of what you said after this, when you refer to quantum orbital after you mentioned the uncertainty principle. And you said, well, it doesn't have to be on the same orbital at the same time. Now, please tell us the first and then explain why the second is the same as the first. Or second is, I mean, when you refer to quantum uh, orbital, it's completely different. Are they same or they're different? Okay, so I'll start with the first question, and then I'll and then I'll try and work on the second one. So the first question was around the the satellite and how it can uh, kind of trade the the position for for speed. I think you were saying basically. So I, the thing about orbital physics, which is the satellite moving without quantum, just normal orbital physics, and, and actually I like the question because it's a little bit like quantum. When you learn about orbital physics, it's about um, 
it's a kind of physics that you're not used to. So if you think about a satellite that's spinning around this way, around the Earth, if you want it to end up at a, a higher orbit, so further from the Earth, you would normally think that you're, you need to use your engine, point the engine towards the Earth to get further away from the Earth. It makes perfect sense, except that in, in, in the physics of things that rotate, that's not what you do. It turns out because it's constantly spinning around. So what you actually do is you point the engine sideways and you make it go faster that way. And that allows it to kind of get a little bit further away from the Earth and then it ends up in a bigger orbit. So orbital physics is something that is not so complicated, but it's still a bit counterintuitive. And that, that kind of helps you understand why quantum is confusing. It's just a bit counterintuitive. You're, again, explain this in terms of Newton's law, which is empirical. Yeah. I'm asking you the question. In your phrasing, I can change space from here to there. Ah. As a result, I can get the space in time. How can we think about creating space or space and time. Right. So so I actually wasn't talking about space time at all. Um, you can if you really care about the orbital physics, then you actually do have to care about space time, which is relativity. Um, but I didn't mean to talk about relativity. I was just talking about a basic Newtonian uh, mechanics. Does that does that answer the question? So I I did I deliberately didn't try and say something about space time, um, because that I think that's another one hour thing. The, the the one thing I'd say though, which is interesting in this topic, is that if you if you've heard about relativity and space time, weirdly enough, we've got really good maths to describe that, and we've got really good maths to predict what happens in the quantum realm, but they don't work together. We can't predict how quantum things work when they're going really fast. Um, so so that's one of the reasons I didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Staying on this side of the auditorium in the back row. Hi. Um, I wanted to know about the colored diamonds. Are they, A, are they found naturally? I think brown ones are for sure. And are they in different strengths once they become a different color? And do you use them for different purposes? Yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant question. So the simple answer is, I think the massive majority of natural diamonds, as you say, are not clear. Um, they're either brown or yellow brown. So there's a lot of nitrogen that you can get in there. Um, and the nitrogen just fits. That's why you get a lot of nitrogen. It's small. Um, and then brown is is more associated with defects that are just like missing carbon atoms and in the wrong configuration and stuff like this. So they're usually some mixture of yellow and brown. Uh, and, and we can also, when we grow diamonds in the lab, and if we don't grow them very well, they also come out brown. Um, the, the, the second question, I think, was around whether it changes the mechanical properties. So the simplest answer is not really because you can make a yellow diamond if you replace roughly one, um, one carbon atom in every million. So you only need one millionth of that, that lattice to change to change the color. Um, and one, million, one in every million doesn't really change the physical properties very much. But it is a question that's been asked. So when people are trying to develop um, cutting tools and things, they, they are interested in does a does a more yellow one or a more brown one work differently? So it's a I think it's still a, a, a live question. The physics of because it's so extreme, the physics of how diamond breaks, for example, is not so trivial. Yeah. yeah. Over on the right in the back, there's someone who has a microphone. Yep, there you are in blue. Wait a minute. Not yet. Should just go straight up. Hello. You can hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Very fascinating. Um, uh, from a perspective of, I'm a molecular biologist, so please bear with me. <laughs> uh, one of the first slides you've uh, described was the application of this system in terms of measuring temperature inside a cell. Apart from that, can it be used for measuring concentration gradient and flux? different compartments inside the cell and if that's possible or what are uh, basically if, if you have anything to to uh, describe on this topic yeah absolutely so so I think the way I describe the field at the moment is we've the 
people started seeing these defects in diamond and started identifying that it's useful and you can you can see them only about 20 years ago um, and so it took us about 10 years to get to the point where we could really make the make it pure and useful and, and figure out what it's what, what we can do with it and then for the last 10 years we've been trying to answer questions like this which is can we really actually um, put it in a system how do we control it does, is my laser too too strong does that heat up the cell all of these kinds of technical questions um, so what I so the the simple answer is those are questions that are currently being asked and answered. People are trying to understand how easy it is for us to detect ions, how easy it is to detect movement of things. Um, can we look at magnetic fields from things? Can we look at temperature? Um, this, and and you can start making complex systems like you can put a layer of something else on the diamond, um, which then responds to the so so people have been grafting molecules under the diamond that then respond to things and putting nanomagnets and then so one of the big things people are doing right now is is nanomagnets are big in in medicine as kind of markers and things you can graft a nanomagnet to something that tells you that something's happening and stays somewhere and the diamond's very good at telling you what where the nanomagnet is so there are a, a host of different things people are trying to do to to, to answer all of these questions um, it, it's a real system, so it's going to be good at some things and not good at others. Okay, I think you. we have time for two more questions. And of course, Dr. Stacy uh, will have a few minutes afterwards if you have, want to come I'm down. Here always then. So uh, there's one, there we go, in the back over there. Hello. I'm wondering since, um, say, you're trying to measure the temperature of a cell and you're trying to use a diamond, which is inherently quantum, how do you account for variances in temperature? due to something like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle or say extra energy you're adding to the system, such as the radio waves or um, lasers. Yeah, right. So, so exactly as you say, when you, when you try and use one of these systems to measure something, you have to try and understand uh, whether the thing that you're trying to measure is responding in a certain way. And sometimes the thing you're trying to measure is quantum, uh, coherent is the word we use and then and then you have to take into account all these things so if you put a diamond inside a cavity an, an optical cavity then actually to, to describe that really well you have to use the quantum properties of the light as well as the quantum properties of the diamond if you're in a cell we don't normally have to worry about that because the noise the fluctuations are usually bigger than the quantum fluctuations um, so it just depends on the system and people spend their entire careers trying to answer that question I think <laughs> Yeah. And one last question for you, right here in the front, over in the right. How's that? No. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is a short answer or like a whole nother lecture, but when you are inserting a different atom into the diamond lattice, what mechanism do you do that tiny, tiny little job? <laughs> Beautiful question. So people have spent about ten years trying to figure that out. So there are two. Normally with materials, there are three answers. And I'll start with the first one, which we can't use, which is called diffusion. So with silicon, you, one thing you can do is just, just put a layer of the thing that you want on the top, heat it up, and it'll kind of diffuse into the material. It'll burrow its way in. Diamond's so tight that it doesn't really work. So we can't use that. So the second option is to just take ions or really energetic. Um, so if you want to put nitrogen in, we can take an ion gun which, which takes individual nitrogens and just fires them into the diamond really high energy. And they kind of slam into the diamond and they stop somewhere. They knock a carbon atom out. And then if you heat it up, it, the nitrogen ends up in the hole and now you've got a nitrogen where you want it. So that's, that's one way that people do it very often. And then the last way is to actually grow it in as you grow. So the, I, I had it up on the screen, but I didn't describe it. Doping when we grow is actually adding things like nitrogen and phosphorus and boron into the gas so that they get incorporated while we're growing. And that's the, that's the other one. Yeah, great question. Before we uh, thank Dr. Stacy one last time, you see on the screen that the first ever Fusion Energy Week is planned for May 6th to 10th. We're including the possibilities of two Science on Saturday type of lectures on either the 5th or the 11th. So the you can- fourth, the fourth. One slide. You just want one slide to get it right. May the 4th. I meant to say may the 4th be with you. Yeah, he beat me to it. Um, 
you either scan the QR code uh, or check our website for the activities that'll be going on, not just here at Princeton, but around the, the country. Uh, Arturo Dominguez and the Science Education Team and the U.S. National Fusion Outreach Team are all organizing that. Um, and with that, uh, as we come to the end of the 2024 Science and Saturday Lecture Series, can we please give an enormous round of applause to Dr. Stacey?